Hello and welcome to Indus News. Live from Islamabad, I'm Naila Shuja and these are the headlines. In Myanmar, the ruling military has charged the international envoy of the country's ousted government with treason. Dr. Sasa has been accused of encouraging a civil disobedience campaign following the first February coup. Nearly 150 people have been killed during the anti-coup protests. A complete shutdown is being observed over extrajudicial killings of two youths by Indian forces in occupied Jammu and Kashmir. All shops and businesses are closed while public transport is also suspended in Shopian and Pulwama districts. Meanwhile, the occupying forces have launched so-called cordon and search operations in Sirinagar, Sopuri and Budgam. Gunmen have killed three Afghan security personnel in an attack on the Pashdan Dam in western Herat province. A spokesman for the National Water Affairs Regulation Authority said four others were wounded in the attack. Meanwhile, two people were killed in an attack on a student bus of Balham University in the city of Polehomiri. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says Washington will continue to work with allies towards the denuclearization of North Korea. It comes after North Korea threatened to scrap inter-Korean cooperation as it condemned the U.S. South Korean military drills. The sister of North Korean leader Kim Yo-jong cautioned Washington against causing a stink if it wants peace. Latvia and Slovenia have joined the rapidly expanding list of countries that have suspended the use of AstraZeneca's COVID-19 vaccine. The World Health Organization says there is no evidence of a link between the vaccine and blood clots. Pakistan has registered over 2,500 infections and 58 fatalities overnight, with a death toll approaching 13,600. Globally, the virus has claimed over 2.6 million lives and infected more than 120 million people so far. And in football, Lionel Messi's brace has helped Barcelona thrash Huesca 4-1 in their Spanish La Liga face-off. The Argentine star also equaled Xavi Alonso's record for most Barcelona appearances with his 767th game. The win moves Barca back into second place, four points behind leaders Atletico Madrid. For more news and details, stay tuned. We'll be right back after a short break. Welcome back. Now in Myanmar, the ruling military has charged the international envoy of the country's ousted government with treason. Dr. Sasa has been accused of encouraging a civil disobedience campaign following the first February coup. He had also called for international sanctions on military leaders. Last month, the country's ambassador to the United Nations was removed after he denounced the coup. The military has intensified its crackdown on anti-coup demonstrations despite sanctions and international calls for restraint. According to the United Nations Human Rights Council, security forces have killed nearly 150 protesters so far. The United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres has urged the international community to help end the repression by Myanmar's military. A complete shutdown is being observed over extrajudicial killings by Indian forces in occupied Jammu and Kashmir. Indian troops earlier killed two youths after blowing up their houses during a three-day-long cordon and search operation. All shops and businesses are closed while public transportation is also suspended in the districts. Meanwhile, occupying forces conducted more of its violent so-called cordon and search operations in Srinagar, Sopore and Budgam. 
Gunmen have killed three Afghan security personnel in an attack on the Pash Dan Dam in the western Herat province. A spokesperson for the National Water Affairs Regulation Authority said four others were wounded. Herat's governor spokesperson has blamed the Taliban for the attack. He said five fighters of the group were killed in retaliation. Meanwhile, two people were killed in an attack on a student bus in Baghlan University in the city of Fuli Khumri. Police have blamed the Taliban, but they have denied the accusation. A United States watchdog on Afghanistan has warned that further aid cuts can imperil the war-torn country. Special Inspector General for Afghanistan's Reconstruction says the slashes by the United States and other donors can cause the government to collapse. In an interview, John Sopko said any such move would return Afghanistan to chaos. He said 80 percent of Afghanistan's budget is funded by the United States and other international donors. Sopko said even the Taliban recognize they really need foreign support. He added the World Bank found that if the peace pact is reached, Afghanistan will need $5.2 billion in aid through 2024. The Arab coalition says it has intercepted another Houthi drone targeting Saudi Arabia's Hamas Mushahid city. Earlier, two Houthi ballistic missiles hit the uninhabited border areas of the same city. A coalition spokesperson says they have destroyed a bunker for ballistic missiles and launch pads in the northern Yemeni province of Sada. He said that they are taking operational measures to protect civilians from extremist attacks. Meanwhile, a Houthi spokesperson said they also fired drones at the King Khalid Air Base in Hamas Mushahid in southern Saudi Arabia. Houthi attacks into Saudi Arabia have escalated in recent weeks. At least five rockets have hit an Iraqi military base housing U.S. troops in north of Baghdad. The Iraqi military says two more rockets fell outside the Balad Air Base and caused damage to a civilian house. The military said that the attack caused no casualties on the ground. No group has claimed responsibility for the attack. Earlier this month, the United States said it will defend its interests at all costs after a rocket attack on Iraq's N. al Saada Air Base. At least 10 rockets were fired at the base in an Ambar province that left a United States contractor dead due to cardiac arrest. U.S. forces retaliated by carrying out airstrikes against facilities at a border control point in Syria used by pro-Iran militias. The United States says it will continue to work with allies towards the denuclearization of North Korea. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said this in a meeting with his Japanese counterpart Toshimitsu Motiki in Tokyo. White House spokesperson Jen Psaki was also who stated that Washington has reached out to North Korea but has not received a response. Talking to the reporters, Psaki said Pyongyang has rebuffed United States calls for dialogue. Meanwhile, North Korea threatened to scrap inter-Korean cooperation as it condemned the United States-South Korea military drills. The sister of a North Korean leader, Kim Yo-jong, warned Washington against causing a stink if it wants peace. She said they warned that new U.S. administration, which is trying hard to give off powder smell in their land. China says cooperation between the United States and Japan must not harm third-party interests. This comes after U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin visited Japan. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Zhao Lijian said U.S. diplomats called China a threat while meeting with Japanese counterparts. At a press conference, Zhao said China believes the U.S.-Japan cooperation should benefit regional peace and stability. Earlier, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken warned China against using coercion and aggression during his first visit to Japan. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin is accompanying Blinken on the trip. Blinken and Austin held a 2 plus 2 meeting with Japanese Foreign Minister Toshimitsu Motegi and Defense Minister Nobuo Kishi in Tokyo. A joint statement said the ministers discussed Washington's unwavering commitment to defend Japan and its territorial dispute with China. In a joint press conference, Motegi said China-related issues took up the majority of his bilateral talks with Blinken. He said the meeting 
Beijing expressed strong opposition to Beijing's attempt to change the status quo in the East and South China Sea. Other issues, including COVID-19 vaccines, semiconductor supply chain security, the military coup in Myanmar and North Korea's nuclear threat was also discussed during the meeting. China has urged the West to stop interfering in the internal affairs of other countries under the pretext of human rights. Head of Chinese Mission to the United Nations Office at Geneva, Chen Zhu was speaking at the 46th session of the UN Human Rights Council. Chen accused the United States, United Kingdom, Australia, Canada and some European Union members of abusing the UNHCR platform. He said they used the platform to spread false information and groundless accusations against China. The envoy reaffirmed Beijing's firm opposition to the propaganda, saying it always puts people first. He said China has made visible achievements in advancing the cause of human rights. The envoy urged the highlighted countries to stop infringing on the human rights of their people and other countries. In India, the farmers' protest along Delhi borders has entered its 111th day today. So far, more than 250 growers have died in the stir against Prime Minister Narendra Modi's contentious laws. The growers have vowed to accelerate the protest and refuse to budge until the centers reappeal reforms that will jeopardize their living. The farmer unions have announced a nationwide strike on the 26th of March, which will mark the completion of four months of the protest. Several trade unions, transporter and retail associations will participate in the strike. Meanwhile, bank employees across India are holding a strike for a second day to condemn the privatization of two public sector banks. The unions warn the strike may take a form similar to the farmers' protest that have been going on since November last year. Demonstrators staged protests in New Delhi, northern Lucknow and Panchkula cities. The strike was called after talks between bank unions and the BJP government failed. The unions say nearly a million staffers across the country have participated in the strike. They say the BJP's government policy is against the interest of the state. Today the government is adamant on closing the public sector banks. They are adamant in giving it into private hands and by giving it to the private sector, the money of our country will go to other countries in the form of dividend. The revenue of our country will go to other countries which is not tolerable to us. Representatives of Greece and Turkey are meeting in Athens in a bid to settle a standoff over the eastern Mediterranean. Little has been released about the agenda for the talks, which took place behind closed doors. Tuesday's meeting follows one in Istanbul in January. These were the first direct talks between the two sides on the dispute in nearly five years. The two sides have not reached common ground in 66 such meetings since the year 2000. Latvia and Slovenia have joined the rapidly expanding list of countries that have suspended the use of AstraZeneca's COVID-19 vaccine. The World Health Organization says there is no evidence of a link between the vaccine and blood clots. Globally, the virus has claimed over 2.6 million lives and infected more than 120 million people. More on the pandemic in this report. The focus of government seems to be shifting to only one vaccine, AstraZeneca, at the moment as they appear divided over its usage against COVID-19. The WHO has urged the countries to continue using AstraZeneca while it has scheduled a meeting of experts to discuss the vaccine's safety today. Canadian health experts say all COVID-19 vaccines being administered in the country are safe, including those made by AstraZeneca. The Oxford vaccine is one of the few that the Brazilian health regulation agency and visa has so far approved but Venezuela says it will not authorize AstraZeneca vaccine citing unspecified effects on patients meanwhile the US continues to be enthusiastic about the inoculation drive over the next 10 days we will reach two goals two giant goals the first is 100 million shots in people's arms will have been completed within the next 10 days and 100 million checks in people's pockets in the next 100 days. 
Major European nations, including Italy, Germany and France, have also suspended the use of AstraZeneca's vaccine. European Center for Disease Prevention and Control data shows the bloc has nearly 8 million doses of AstraZeneca vaccine sitting unused. The European Medicines Agency has echoed the WHO's calls for calm and says it is better to get the Oxford vaccine than not. Meanwhile, Estonian Prime Minister Kaja Kalas has tested positive for COVID-19. In France, hospitals Hospitals and intensive care units face mounting stress due to the pandemic. Every day we have one or two beds available in intensive care, which isn't a lot. Today we have 34 patients hospitalized in intensive care because of COVID, among the total of 73 beds available. So that means that we have a lot of patients that are here for other diseases. So if necessary, we can postpone surgeries or medical treatments other than COVID. Thai Prime Minister Prayuth Shan Oka has become the country's first person to be inoculated with the AstraZeneca vaccine after the rollout was temporarily put on hold over safety concerns. Australia says it has no plans to halt the use of the Oxford vaccine. Meanwhile, for the sixth straight day, India has reported more than 20,000 cases overnight. Meanwhile, in Pakistan, another 58 people have died from COVID-19 and over 2,500 tested positive for the virus overnight. The health ministry says the countrywide death toll is approaching 13,600. Pakistan's caseload has crossed 607,000, of which more than 571,000 people have recovered. The ministry says the number of active cases in the country has topped 23,000, and nearly 2,400 people are admitted in the hospitals across the country. Meanwhile, the government has started walk-in COVID-19 vaccinations for citizens aged 70 and above. Pakistan's outgoing Air Chief Marshal Mujahid Anwar Khan has paid a farewell visit to Pakistan's Army Chief General Kamar Javed Bajwa. During the meeting at the General Headquarters in Rawalpindi, the Army Chief thanked the Chief of Air Staff for his services to the nation during his long and illustrious career. He lauded his services during the operation, swift retort and critical support rendered in the fight against terrorism. The Army Chief said the Air Chief Marshal's immense efforts and quality leadership made the Pakistan Air Force second to none. Earlier on arrival at GHQ, Mujahid Anwar Khan was presented the Guard of Honor. Bahrain has lauded Pakistan Navy's role in maintaining peace and order in the Indian Ocean region. Bahrain's Naval Forces Commander Commodore Mohammed Yusuf al Assam shared these views while meeting Pakistan's Naval Chief. Pakistan's Naval Chief Mohammed Amjad Khan Niazi is on a visit to Bahrain to discuss regional security and ways to boost cooperation. Bahrain's Naval Head received Admiral Niazi on his arrival and presented the Guard of Honor. Niazi held separate meetings with leaders of Bahrain's defense forces. Pakistan's Navy media wing says that the two sides discussed matters related to maritime security and defense collaborations. Admiral Niazi underscored the Navy's initiative of regional maritime security patrols to ensure peace and order in the region. It's now time for a short break. Stay with us. Welcome back. At the United Nations, Pakistan has proposed a global compact for women's empowerment plan to ensure their participation in decision making. Envoy Munir Akram virtually addressed the 65th session of the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women. The envoy proposed concrete measures to eliminate violence against women and girls. He said despite progress, women's voices continue to be silenced and their participation in public life obstructed. He called on the international community to ensure that women who constitute half of the world's population are never left behind. Thousands took to the streets of Bolivia in protest against the arrest of former President Jeanine Anez. She has begun a four-month jail term over her alleged role in a coup that led to the removal of Evo Morales from power in 2019. 
The protesters chanted slogans in favor of Anise and called her a brave woman. Earlier, police took Anise into custody from her home in Trinidad and transferred her to a woman's prison in the capital, La Paz. Justice Minister Ivan Lima said he would seek a 30-year jail sentence if Anise is convicted of fomenting a coup. Her energy and justice ministers also were ordered into custody. The three faced charges of terrorism, sedation and conspiracy over the alleged coup. Even after 10 years since the crisis in Syria erupted, war refugees are forced to live in extremely tough and miserable conditions. The story of such a family is in this report. Habis al Mahmoud and his family have been in a continuous struggle against hunger, diseases, cold, and what not for the past several years. Mahmoud is a war refugee who lives in a scruffy tent with his wife and five children in a camp for the displaced persons in central Syria. But the living conditions over here are still better than the overcrowded Rukban camp where they previously lived. In the Rukban camp, we did not have water to drink and could only drink the rainwater in the pit. I could see the worms squirming in the water. Mahmoud and his family have been left exhausted by years of drifting around and greatly missed the happier, worry-free days before the Syrian crisis erupted. Before the war, we used to have everything. Services such as heating and public medical care were all free. According to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, Syria remains the world's largest refugee crisis. Since 2011, over 6.6 .6 million Syrians have been forced to flee their homes and another 6.7 million people remain displaced in the country. Icelanders are yearning for some undisturbed shut-eye after a couple of jittery weeks, literally. Tremors from tens of thousands of earthquakes have rattled their sleep in an unprecedented seismic event, which might well end in this spectacular lava show. More in this report. Located between the Eurasian and the North American tectonic plate, Iceland frequently experiences earthquakes. The source of the past week's earthquakes is a large body of molten rock known as magma, moving roughly one kilometer beneath the peninsula as it tries to push its way to the surface. So the situation in Grindavik is quite uncomfortable right now. Everyone is sleep deprived because the earth is constantly moving all day, all night. Some earthquakes are bigger than others, some are 3.1, some are 4.2. Today we had a big one, 5.4. Authorities in Iceland warned of an imminent volcanic eruption on the peninsula in early March, but said they did not expect it to disturb international air traffic or damage critical infrastructure nearby. So uh, there are some concerns about infrastructure on the Reykjanes Peninsula and what would happen if we have an eruption. Of course, the international airport is very close. But since the eruption is likely going to be very quiet and not very explosive and no huge amounts of ash, so that should not uh, be an effect on the airport, hopefully. More than 14,000 earthquakes have occurred since the 24th of February, exceeding the total number of earthquakes registered on the peninsula last year. A robot manufacturer in Russia has started research and development into making robots look more like their creators. Promobot aims to create a realistic appearance for humanoid robots using 3D modeling and hyper-realistic artificial skin. This report has more. Robots will soon look like us thanks to the efforts of Fyotr Chergadov, a Russian sculptor, architect designer and 3D modeler. Chergadov says the goal is to bring the aesthetics of sculpture and art into humanoid robots. He believes that progress in the fast-growing field of robotics requires a combination of art and technology. Currently, the lab is developing a prototype of a male humanoid robot, Alexei, and mass production is scheduled to start by the end of the year. At the moment, we are focused on Alexei's elaboration. The technologies are all identical. 
if we make a high quality eye, we can use it for all our other models. Therefore, now the most important thing is to bring those developments that we have to mass production. We plan to have mass production of these technologies by the end of the year, and we want to start producing the whole body, not only the head, but also to have a full torso and legs and to make all of this movable. Promobot supplies its robots to government offices and Russian universities. It has also signed new contracts with some U.S. university service. Promobots work in 40 countries around the world as administrators, promoters, consultants, guides and concierge, replacing or supplementing human employees. At the moment, we supply robots to the government centers in Moscow, various universities, our regular customers, and medical universities. There is also a large and promising market in the United States where universities are also mostly interested, and we already signed some contracts and so on. In 2019, the Promobot V4 model robot became an employee of the American College of North Carolina. Developers at the company are currently working on Robo-C as well as developing service robots of Promobot V4 model. Nominations for this year's Oscars have been announced as Los Angeles ahead of the virtual ceremony on the 25th of April. Netflix Hollywood drama Mank is leading the nominations with 10 nods, including Best Picture. This report has more. After many delays of this pandemic year, the Oscar nominations are finally upon us. Sasha Baron Cohen, Carrie Mulligan, 